And I said, Michael, there is no way on God's earth that a health inspector walked into our premises, a slug in a pocket and dropped it in a corner. If they don't get stopped, these people will be emboldened to continue what they're doing. And it won't be just Ian and his family and I called Foods Destroyed and 41 other lives gone. It'll be the next family and the next family. And it'll be for different reasons. What has happened to us would happen to anyone else. If these people are allowed to get away with this, what will happen in the future is another family will be destroyed. This can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, if I talk about food businesses, under, the, under what and the way they did this, no food business in Victoria is safe. The other thing that comes out as we go through it, which, if you like, angers me and makes me continue on to go on, is that this Food Act was actually changed by the then Health Minister in 2010, Daniel uh, Andrews. Daniel Andrews. He changes it. Now, what does he do? He writes corruption into this Act. everyone and welcome to a special edition of The People's Project. I am here today with Ian Cook from I Cook Foods and today we're going to be discussing one of the biggest news headlines at the moment which is the I Cook Foods Sluggate Saga and let me tell you trying to put this story together it is a saga. So we've brought Ian in today in order to chat through what's happened so far and just give people the ability to see everything start to end on what's happened so far because the things that are gonna come out are big. And so welcome Ian, thank you so much for being here. All right, thanks Emily. Tell us a little bit about yourself and also a little bit about iCook and when you started. Okay, so uh, basically iCook Foods started in December 1985. Well, it actually started in September 1985. We um, grew and built a contract um, catering business and then got into food manufacturing and built up to the point where we were the largest private provider of delivered meals. In Victoria, so delivered meals people would know as Meals on Wheels. Yep. Um, and the pretty much the other half of our business was delivering food components, so components that we put together to make a complete meal mm. for hospitals. We'd been trotting along for 30 years, doing really good work. And then along came a slug. Along sort came of. a slug, yeah. So we'll go through briefly, I guess, a quick overview on what happened. Uh, so there was a woman who died... A slug found in the kitchen, an excessive shutdown, Yep. depending on who you ask, and now you're going after the Department of Health and the Council. So just run me through really briefly what's kind of happened up until this point. So the woman, uh, the woman actually was, they isolated Listeria in her system late January. In summary, uh, the woman who died, she was at Knox Private Hospital at the time, just for, for context. Yep. They find out she's got Listeria in her system yep. on the, basically the 25th of um, January. Yep. Um, on the 1st of February, they come in and take some samples. This is from an EHO from Danon, comes into our premises. Um, and, and, and this is back in 2019. This, this is, yep. So yep. this is, they do the sampling on the 1st of February, 2019. Yep. So they then get the sample results back 18 days later. The department gets it and actions it. Nothing is done in between. Yep. And... Um, on the day that they that they get the the results back, they notify Danny Nong again, and this time Danny Nong sends in a different environmental health officer, health inspector. Her name's Elizabeth Garlic, and that's the day of the slug. So she does a um, a walkthrough with our food safety supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, when she does that, she just she she goes up into one of the far corners of the kitchen. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a kitchen that is like eight or 900 square metres, so yep. it's a big kitchen. Big kitchen. Um, we have a small dry store area where um, soups, dry soup mixes are kept and mm -hmm. there's tubs there. Um, and the from the end of the tubs to the wall is like maybe, I don't know, 400, 500, you know, it, half a metre or less. Yeah. And she goes into that corner where she can't be seen and our CCTV pick her up until she crouches down yep. and she's off. The camera for 17 seconds to put that in perspective if i sat here going one elephant two elephant three elephant you can imagine it's a long time and then she stands up and proclaims that there's a live slug on the floor there and so basically what happens we'll, we'll go back into some details later but said slug is found yep said photos are taken which we'll come back to later and all of a sudden you're shut down yep now next thing you're also on the news for being shut down 
Yep. Now, there's something unusual about that. Sutton actually got up and named the business, yep. which my understanding is not a normal process necessarily no. to suddenly get up and, and name the business. And for context for people watching, this is where Sutton plays into it. So he was the acting chief health officer at the time. Correct. Back in 2019. And as a result, when a business gets shut down for health reasons, the only person who can authorize that is the chief health officer. So the health, and correct me if I'm wrong, the workers in the councils are the ones who do the inspections and then provide the reports to him. And it's on the basis of a report that he is meant to make those decisions. Is that? That's pretty much right. So the difference now is that Sutton actually shouldn't have been the one that shut us down. Really? Under the Food Act, it's the relevant authority, which is the CEO or the council as a group. Okay. So the councillors of the city of Denning or the CEO, they have to approve a report of an authorised officer, which would be garlic. Yep. And then that action leads you through three processes and 19, one, two, three, and you're closed. You were shut down for quite a number of weeks. Uh, and I believe you actually challenged the shutdown. Yeah, we did. We've challenged them a couple of times in the courts when they've brought um, stuff up and, and tried you know, different ways of stopping us from yep. trading. Uh, that particular, every time... Every time we challenge them or get them almost to the court, they pull the pin and run away. First, they were trying to get me in jail. So they, the breaches that they first wanted to charge me under were what we call Section 8. They're the indictable offences mm -hmm. in the Food Act, um, and that would have meant jail time. Yep. Uh, then when one of their own came out and blew the whistle, they changed, they pulled those charges and they put up 96 summary offences, which would have turned into 11.5 million approximately in fines. Just, just to really... Nail in on this. You're actually at court yep. at this point. You are about to walk into court. Correct. They have 96 charges against you. Yes. That would, to them, potentially be millions of dollars in fines. Correct. And they pulled the pin on the day. Yep. That's insane. So everything started through the fact that a woman died and during, I believe, relatively routine blood tests done, Listeria was detected. The department, when they shut us, did not have any scientific information that showed that the the level of listeria. Yeah. It's not until after we're shut. So we're shut on the 22nd. On the 25th, they start that test. By the 28th of February, they get the results. They then hide those results for two weeks. Those results showed that the level of listeria, supposedly in our food, was 10 times under the safe legal limit. So you had 10 times under what it would be regardless. So it got determined it wasn't a cause of death anyway. You did actually test positive, but at a level that should you have been tested at any other point, you still would have been compliant yep. and there was no actual issue with that. And one of the things that has obviously since come out is a report from Knox Council to DHHS as well as uh, some legal correspondence to you that they didn't actually have any proof at the time that it was your food that the woman ingested. Correct. So she was on a special diet of some kind, which meant she couldn't have eaten your food. Is that is that's, that right? That's correct. Yeah. So what they do is they second people from council now because they were dealing with Knox Private Hospital. They went to Knox City Council. Yep. They second a guy called um, Ray Christie, yep. who's told you need to go in and do uh, this this report and this report. The catering staff and the infection control people within the hospital both told Ray Christie that she hadn't eaten any of our food. And he told me in a telephone conversation, point blank, he said, Ian, I did those interviews. They told us they didn't eat any of your food. And I said, did you take samples? He said, we took no samples, nothing. It was all done outside protocols. So the actual collection of the evidence in order to make the claim that they did didn't happen? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so the report goes to... The department. Yep. So it goes to the lead investigator who's reporting directly to the chief health officer. Yep. And it says, I cook foods did not eat, uh, sorry, did not provide anything that this woman ate. That they, they get that on the morning of the 22nd. They know at that time that there was no food provided by us. And yet they go to a press conference, three o'clock in the afternoon, they name us and they say, and Sutton says that it's because of a sandwich and because a woman had died and that thousands could be at risk. When asked about the shutdown later on, Sutton agreed that the sandwiches were below levels that were safe, so the Food Authority, yep. and said if that had been the only element of concern, they wouldn't have been shut down. But 
every other element of concern that they raised, they dropped. Yes, yeah, so that's right, because the only elements of concern that he had at the time he said that, right, so, so he has to have had yeah. that prior to the 22nd. So the department had never had anybody in our premises prior to closing us. They could only reply on they could only rely on reports from Elizabeth Garlic and from her boss Leanne Johnson. Mm -hmm. Now Garlic writes what's called a 19 notice, which she illegally produces, but that notice has 37 corrective actions on it, which is what Sutton's talking about. They claim to have never seen it. We have evidence that shows they did have it and they did know about it. Um, that's what they're relying on. They were the other things. Those 37 items are also, they form um, 37 of the charges okay, for the so company and myself. When you say it was an illegal report, how do you mean? Okay, so under the Food Act, there's a check and a balance. So a health inspector goes into a premises. If they find the premises unclean, um, filthy, et cetera, et cetera, they will write up corrective actions. Yep. And that's what's called a 19 two notice. Mm -hmm. They can't issue that until they've taken a report back to the relevant authority, which is the CEO of the council or the council as a group, as a whole. So they go back and they say, here's what we found in these premises. We're very concerned. We want to issue a 19-2 notice. The CEO, in this instance, will look at it and go, okay, I've seen the videos. I've seen your photos. I understand what you're telling me. Yes, it sounds bad. Okay, I'm either going to go and look myself or I agree with you. Okay, I agree with your report. Off you go. You can now write your 19-2 notice. The thing about Garlic's is that if you read Garlic's, on the top of her 19 notice, her 19-1, it says, I, Elizabeth Garlic, being satisfied from my own report. So she's made herself the relevant authority and the health officer. So she's just elevated herself. She's now the CEO. So, and so this notice is what shut you down. This notice was used. So this notice, plus some stuff that her boss did, was sent into the department yep. to make us look as bad as possible. Now, you have, at this point, been fighting for literally years, almost two and a half, two and years, and a half years, years, years. Yeah. And I think that that really speaks volumes as to the tenacity that you pursued this feeling as if you've been wronged and you, you have the right of it. Because honestly, why else would you keep going with this? This is obviously consumed your life for years at this point. Yeah, it's important to us on the basis that what has happened to us could happen to anyone else. If these people are allowed to get away with this, what will happen in the future is another family will be destroyed. Anyone with a food business in the city of Dandenong should be very nervous. In fact, in any of the cities of Melbourne. And this can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, if I talk about food businesses, under, the, under what and the way they did this, no food business in Victoria is safe. The other thing that comes out as we go through it, which, if you like, angers me and makes me continue on to go on, is that this Food Act was actually changed by the then Health Minister in 2010, Daniel uh, Andrews. Daniel Andrews. He changes it. Now, what does he do? He writes corruption into this Act. This is the only Act we can find in Victoria where a council who gets rights and infringement notice or who um, takes someone to court, it actually says in the Act that those funds are to go back to the council. Even the police don't have that. What do you mean the funds are to go back? What do you mean any, by that? Any, any fines, so any fines, any um, infringement notice fines that are issued to a food business in Victoria, that money goes directly back to the council that issued the fine. So not to the state? Not to the state, not to consolidate a revenue. And it used to go to the poor box is my understanding. I've never been in court for food matters, but that's yeah. what I was told happened. So, um, and then all of a sudden, as, as time goes by, you get rate capping under the same uh, minister when he becomes premier, mm. and uh, you have councils now, they have their own revenue source if they want it. So one of the reasons I really wanted to do this was as information has come out over time, the natural reporting process for the media is simply to release information as it comes out. Yep. And there isn't really kind of a, a start to finish on just how much has come out, what happened at the time and what we know now. And I think what we know now is the problem because we know that they knew more than they were letting on. Yep. And this has massive ramifications for whether or not they did the right thing and acted legally what they've now done in the inquiry and the criminal investigation, if there's been inappropriate use of evidence, if there 
has been intentional, um, I don't want to say hiding, but... No, it was intentional. Yeah, I, I can't think of a better word than hiding, um, of, of things like that. And you get images that come out. Um, I know Georgie Crazy around the FOI. So, again, supporting you guys. And I think it was in March this year, 2021, Crozier did the FOI. On Knox. On Knox. So what she did was she asked for critical correspondence between Knox City Council and DHHS. And of the 452 pages that got returned as the FOI, so FOI's Freedom of Information Act, uh, almost 400 were blacked out. You know what? Uh, when this all first started, I just, I, I, I could not believe. If you'd asked me two and a half, three years ago, or even told me this story, I would say to you, oh, really, Emily, it's a little bit far-fetched. And I, went, and I had great belief in the system. Mm -hmm. I can also tell you that when Michael, our food safety supervisor, and he's my brother, he sat in front of me at my desk, he said, she did it. And I said, Michael, there is no way on God's earth that a health inspector walked into our premises, a slug in her pocket, and dropped it in a corner. So he goes through with me the 17 seconds sitting in the corner and then he pulls the clip for the Wednesday so this is on the Monday Tuesday she doesn't do an inspection just pushes just drops those mm -hmm. notices on us on the Wednesday she comes in does another inspection makes a beeline for the um, corner where she dropped the slug and she's literally trying to talk Michael into the fact that the slug came in on lettuces through our fire escape so it's like she was creating her own alibi for it all of that I said okay that's all circumstantial Michael until he shows me her, she's looking and she looks and she spots the camera, she looks away and then she does the double take. Now I have seen that double take and I've run cash businesses, all sorts of businesses, and the only time I've ever seen that double take is when someone's been stealing from the till. Now there's two things I want to bring up at this point because I thought these were very interesting. As I, was, as I was trying to piece together this saga from all the dozens of articles online that have sort of been bits reporting, with the image of the slug, your food controller was very, very clever and took a photo as well. Correct. So the council's photo presenting the slug was missing a certain element that was in your photos, which was a tiny, tiny piece of tissue sitting on the floor next to the slug, that there is no explainable way why there is a tiny scrap of tissue sitting on the floor of a commercial kitchen. So what's really interesting about that, she declared she's found the slug. Because it's such a narrow corner where she is, Michael has to walk around her to see what she's talking about. So she steps back, he walks around, Michael looks. Michael produces his phone from his pocket and immediately takes a photo. So his photo is time stamped, I think, eight seconds or 10 seconds after Garlic's photo. Yep. So we know these photos are right next to each other. Yep. Our floor has little pieces, grains of sand that are in the two-pack, in the paint that goes over it. Mm -hmm. And that's so that people don't slip in a wet kitchen and hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. This piece of tissue is obviously wet because when you enlarge that photo, it's actually literally following the contour of one of the grains of, of sand. Okay. And it is just this far from the slug. Now, that indicated to us straight away that this slug came in in wet tissues. My assistant, my... Um, administration manager who brought her in and got her to wear the coat in the first place and the jacket to, to gown up to go into the factory. She said she was she appeared nervous on the Monday and she was patting her pockets down. Leisha said to her, you okay, is everything all right? And she said, oh, yeah, I just want to make sure I've got anything. And she said in one of her, she was wearing like a nurse's scrub with big pockets in the front mm -hmm. and one of them was bulging with tissues. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting about this you had had a pest inspection done two days before this. The Friday, So yeah. a, a normal pest inspection done yep. for a commercial premises who had been the same person coming, I believe, and doing your pest inspections for 15 years yep. and had never found a thing, did a pest inspection 48 hours beforehand, didn't find a trace of anything. So this is a professional yes, pest right. inspection that you require to be compliant as a commercial yep. premises, didn't find anything and made very interesting comments and I think led you to actually get a report done on yep. slugs and their behaviour, saying that a slug in the middle of the day, there was no slime trail, and even the pest inspector went, the, the grade of chemicals used on the floor in a premises like that, particularly towards, say, the end of your day at the time, meant that the slug would actually die. But it won't, yeah, it won't touch it. That's very interesting because one of the detectives that's worked with us had asked us to do an experiment. So we went and got a clear plastic 
like a clear plastic plate. Yep. Like you would get on the top of those press down cakes you buy from Woolies or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it had to have nothing on it, be completely clean, etc. Um, we then had to source a slug of the same size and visually look like the same variety. It's not always possible to know exactly the variety of slugs is what I'm told. But we got something that to us looked exactly the same. Yeah. Um, so what we did was he asked us, would we do our floors the way we normally do them, wash them down? And would we um, then place a clean disc and put the slug on it and see what it did? So we did the experiment he asked. Now, we didn't have any other chlorine-based cleaner because, remember, this is now two years. We've been shut. Nothing's happened. Mm -hmm. So all we had was the normal um, light lemon-scented detergent that we use to wash the floors down. Yeah. So because we did with, oh, well, we'll do the experiment. So we washed the floor down. It was left a couple of nights because that's the, that was the time frame of what supposedly happened. And then the boys go in. They put this plastic down. They put a slug on it. So the slug is on the plastic it's on, on the a, floor. Yeah, it's on plastic on our floor. Okay, yeah. It goes up to the edge of the plastic, goes to go over it. It literally comes off onto the floor a centimetre and a half or so, and then, then it, it doubles back on itself and comes back onto the plastic. Then it goes all the way around the plastic rim. Yeah. So if you, in, in terms of a clock, goes off, I think, about 2 o'clock, goes round to 10 o'clock, sensing all the way, then it goes off again. And it tries to go a little bit further, does exactly the same thing doubles back on itself and comes back. It would not get off the plastic. It, it was moving around. So what they then did was they picked it up with this slug on it. They took it outside and they put it on the concrete outside. Mm -hmm. And this was a cool, damp day. The slug goes straight off the plastic, straight off to a crack in the concrete and straight down. So you actually, and this I think is so interesting just in the sense that I, I liked the public comments made by the pest controller because he was just so genuinely confused. He said, yeah. this makes, why would a slug be out during the day? Why is there no slime trail in any image? Where Where is this, has it flown in? I thought that was very funny. Um, and also he said, you know, he does pest inspection for a living. He goes, you know, slugs are obviously very sensitive to whatever is on the ground. Why would they choose to go over what is essentially a swimming pool of chemicals? Yeah, they don't like it. The conversation we had previously about the fact that your your food safety manager, you have on on video him looking at the spot where the slug yep. supposedly was, what, a few minutes before it was discovered? Oh, seconds. Seconds before he, it was he discovered. He walks up. Yeah, so they walk up into the corner. He's looking into the corner. Yeah. And she's, she, garlic's standing here beside him, and then she steps ahead of him, yep. in front of him, taking photos. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's how she does her inspections, by the way. She just takes thousands of photos, sits at her desk and writes up... Um, Charges. Yeah. So, I mean, every single part of it to say that, you know, he wouldn't have seen a black slug on what is essentially yep. a white floor. Um, bless them, they obviously are not the fastest creatures on the planet. Yep. Uh, you would think within a couple of seconds you would have seen something. I, I've been in this business for over 30 years and I have never seen a slug like that arrive in a premises the only time you would ever see anything from that you would call a garden insect is in lettuce or celery right down in the bases. You know, you open them, which is why we wash things. Yep. And if you did get any sort of mollusk, you're talking about stuff this big, a few mm. millimetres. This this is a big slug. How, how big is this? Just give me a... a... It, it's about this big. It's about, okay. What's that? Five, six centimetres? Okay. So she's, it's not small. No, no. And it. Um, let's assume it came in on a lettuce. God knows you would see something where where all our fruit and veg comes in and the sink that it comes in to be washed in is what we call an ozone sink. Mm -hmm. And so it goes there. From Let's assume it escaped from there. For it to go from there to this corner is 46 metres across, um, right across the middle of a busy kitchen. It just defies Which logic. no one would see. The slug doesn't die. Doesn't get stood on. There's no slime trail. Yep. It swims across the chemical pool for almost 50 metres yep. to only be suddenly discovered by the health officer that is there at that exact, what, 10-minute yep. window? Correct. Our CCTV camera fit footage, our guys start at four in the morning and they finish one, two in the afternoon. Mm. We start early and we finish early. Um, when she comes in, we're washing down. So what, our, what time was this then? She comes in about one o'clock. Okay, yep. Okay. So um, the, the CCTV camera footage, ours, mm. shows 64 visits to that exact spot by our staff from four in the morning until she arrives. 
Okay, so, and you're telling me a five centimetre black slug isn't noticed by my staff? That's just rubbish. And if you actually watch the camera footage, uh, Michael, our food safety supervisor, is walking with her. And as they come around to that area, Michael is looking straight in at that corner. Uh, you can see that on camera as she weaves her way in there. So your food safety supervisor was oh, on camera looking at the exact spot on the floor where yep. she found a slug. She's, he's looking straight into that corner. As he said, if there was a slug there, I would have seen it. This is, I mean, when you start getting into this, it's, it is exactly, I guess, what you said before. You, you almost couldn't imagine it. It's just got no. so many different moving parts and the fact that new information is coming out almost every week at this point. Uh, I just, this is going to be massive in terms of what, what ends up being found. If they don't get stopped, these people will be emboldened to continue what they're doing. And it won't be just Ian and his family and I called Foods Destroyed and 41 other lives you want. It'll be the next family and the next family. And it'll be for different reasons. To even get a, a clear end to end of your story and what's happened is so difficult because so many different things have happened over yeah. the years that obviously get reported as they happen. So to be able to sit down and do whatever it is that we at the People's Project are able to do to promote what you are doing, why why it's important as well, and what the wider ramifications may be from actually pursuing this to having consequences. It could protect and save a lot of businesses. And I think as well, you know, even if it just helps clear your family name that, no, you didn't accidentally kill someone, I think that that is worth it. I think it's worth being able to get your story out there so that people understand and there will now be so much interest around this inquiry, which I will obviously be watching the entire thing. Um, so yet another thing that I will do. I think that, that that actually brings up another issue for me about all this, and that is that the the way I see it is that this reopening of this inquiry should um, if advance what I think is a loss of democracy in Victoria. You have a public, um, you have parliamentarians who rely on evidence coming to them so that they can make good decisions about inquiries, legislation, whatever they want to do. Yep. If you have people who do not use privilege properly, and privilege is exactly that, it's a privilege. You can say whatever you like to an inquiry, even if it hurts or offends or maligns someone else, as long as it's the truth. If you don't tell the truth, if you don't give all the evidence, then these politicians can't make valid decisions about what they should do. There should be more done now on the Food Act, etc. They can't make those decisions because someone's lied to them or misrepresented the facts. Democracy demands that we have privilege so people can talk openly, and it should be just that. And for people not to use it properly, um, that's, well, it's a contempt of parliament, but it also means that our democracy gets damaged. And we, we can't have that. It has to be that they get the truth told to them. They can't just, I didn't remember, or I don't know, or I'm going to give you this set of circumstances because I think it furthers my cause. Yeah, exactly. And I think that this is something, particularly here in Victoria, that seeing that relentless push for transparency and accountability for bureaucratic powers, that is what we need to see right now. We yeah. need to have that, that faith restored. And I think it was in one of your previous interviews as well that one of the reasons you are doing this is because you've lost faith in the system and you want to see that faith restored. Correct. You want to see what actually happened come out, there be consequences. Because at the end of the day, if and when the inquiry does happen, if it is found that they lied or withheld evidence and there are very serious consequences, that serves as a lesson. And it means that this is less likely to happen in future to other people and it kind of improves the democracy that we have because anyone who would do the wrong thing has kind of gone, you're not going to get away with this now. Correct. There are people that are going to fight this. A precedent has been set because if nothing else, you have shown that if this does happen to another business, what they can do about it. Yes. Uh, which I think will be really important moving forward. So I just wanted to say a massive thank you for no coming in and having a chat. Um, I know that there will be a lot of information coming out over the next couple of weeks in regards to the inquiry, uh, more evidence uh, specifically. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Some of the things that you've been speaking about are fantastic. And um, yeah, we'll be following the inquiry really, really closely. Uh, everything is live streamed. Everything is public. So there is always a transcript of every question, every response, everything else. Yep. And so everyone will be able to see for themselves what comes out uh, this second time around. And 
that I think is something that will be of great interest to, to the public. So thank you so much for your time. No worries. Thank you for having me. Unlike most mediums, this is a great way to unpack what you want to say, to put some substance behind it. I don't think there's many other forums where a politician or anyone for that matter can actually say much beyond a soundbite. Mm. But to actually have the opportunity to talk through issues, to give people an understanding of what your thinking is, and to just have that ability to, to unpick everything, that's what I find really positive about this experience. So I invite people to come on, would you recommend they accept that invitation? Yeah, I absolutely would, because I think that you you might have your own views, which, you know, to some degree might colour what you think, but I don't think that you try to push them onto who you're interviewing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you, you're happy to take a contrary view just for the sake of exploring the issue more, more deeply. Mm -hmm.